This conference will now be recorded. Uh, welcome everyone to the most recent uh, iteration of Novak's webinar series. Um, thank you for participating. Um, we think it's been a, a pretty successful series. We've get, had a quite a quite a bit of people attend a number of these, and we hope we're providing um, valuable information and just ever more tools to help the OHV community uh, with Novak's mission of creating a positive future for OHV recreation. Um, I'll start by just talking a little bit about how our webinars tend to work. Uh, we typically, the presenter will do the his, pre his or her presentation um, for for an amount of time, usually 30 to 45 minutes. Um, we like to get through that without a lot of interruptions because sometimes um, when we get a bunch of people talking um, during during the presentation, it's hard to stay on track. Um, so we'll, you will be put on mute, and if you would stay on mute till till the end, that would be appreciated. There is, however, a chat feature. Um, it's typically on the right-hand side, but it's in the little bar with the picture of the phone at the top. Um, you can type in a question at any time uh, in that feature. Myself and Laura will monitor that, and uh, in rare occasions, we might even break in if it's super relevant to the topic that, uh, that Chris is going to be talking about at the moment. But almost all of the questions will be held till the end, um, where we'll read them to Chris and he can provide his response. Um, we're really, really excited to have Chris Real with us today. Um, personally, I've been in the uh, power sports space for probably about 16 years now, and uh, one of the names that I've heard throughout that 16 years is Chris Real. Uh, he's generally regarded as the uh, the authority on uh, all things sound and noise. He has his, uh, a company of his own called DPS Technical. Um, he's done all kinds of work, both in the U.S. and internationally, uh, in the world, in the sort of world of specialty vehicles, um, he is, in my opinion, at least as I've heard it for for nearly two decades, the authority um, on all things sound. And uh, I think he's going to provide quite a bit of really good information that'll be helpful to to a broad group of OHV enthusiasts and land managers. So, without any further ado, I'd like to to turn it over to Chris Real and have him do his presentation. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you, Dwayne. Um, first of all, you know, it, it's it's a it's an honor and a privilege to be able to to, to speak to everybody, and um, and this presentation is is just going to scratch the surface of one of the uh, one of the topics that always comes up when we're talking about motorized vehicles and and particularly motorized recreation. And so I'm going to uh, go through, you know, uh, a, a few slides and I hope that, uh, you know, I can uh, spur some thoughts. And I always start one of these presentations with saying it's it's really not my presentation, it's it's yours. So I thank you for participating and I hope that uh, as we go through this, uh, I can answer your questions. Um, so that, uh, that you're uh, equipped to, to deal with the challenges that, that you're facing uh, with, with motorized recreation. Um, and so, uh, you know, a, yeah, slide please. So, you know, a, a little bit about my background is uh, I've done my complete professional working career in the uh, motorcycle and specialty uh, vehicle industry um, started life as a test rider and a business uh, owner um, uh, back in the in the early 70s mid 70s um, marched through you know a couple decades um, our business became uh, sought after and we sold it and then I immediately hung out my shingle to do some things that were interesting to me and valuable, I hope, to, to the community. And, um, you know, all disclosures aside, you know, um, I am a motorcyclist. I thoroughly enjoy all forms of, of, of racing, and I've had the good fortune of participating as a, as a test rider early in my career, a racer in the middle, a wounded racer halfway through that, and back to a test rider, and, and I get to test many of the vehicles that are coming to the United States and, and elsewhere. And so our company, DPS Technical, we test 
about a hundred different engine families per year, uh, ranging from you know low speed uh, scooters and low speed specialty vehicles on up to the um, you know the the super high performance uh, motorcycles, and of course our automotive side keeps us keeps us pretty busy. Uh, slide, please. So a couple of things that we do um, in, in testing other than sound, and we'll get to sound here in a moment, uh, but you know, we, we do the pitch stability testing for ATVs and of course ROVs. Um, I, you know, I like to say, I, you know, I, I flip ATVs with precision and a fancy report. Uh, fortunately, it's all, all of us, all of it's a static test where we have it on a, a tip table and there is a dynamic portion where we do a driving test and have outriggers on it. And, and we look for the center of gravity and, and how that makes the vehicle respond. Some of the other things that we do is we monitor emissions uh, for uh, federalization for the manufacturers. We help them through some of the process of, of getting a, a, a emission certificate of conformity or an EO on an executive order which allows vehicles to be sold um, in in the United States and Canada. So very early in the in the process we'll have access to to very low uh, first articles. You know usually we get a P2, a prototype two, uh, and it'll come through and we'll take some you know a look at it and provide you know uh, information on if we think it's going to be able to go through the rest of the process and, and be a federally compliant vehicle. And so I will see a vehicle probably about two years before it um, pops out into the marketplace, maybe a little bit uh, longer than two years. And so we'll see the ugly duckling and, and, and she'll come through the, through, through our, uh, our facility and then come back and she'll be almost a, you know, a swan you know, about a year and a half later, we'll do final testing, and then uh, then it'll show up uh, after it gets through the regulatory process. So, um, so having VIN numbers of 0001 or 0002 is not uncommon for us. So, so it's an exciting time to be a you know a motorcyclist because we have some really interesting things coming. Some of the other things that we monitor and and report on are on the environmental side. You know, we we look at at storm water. Uh, wind, erosion, dust, and of course sound. And um, and a lot of the sound for some of the facilities is going into a a web-based remote monitoring um, uh, method so that we can uh, you know uh, prove our innocence and know what our sound levels are on any given day or any given time. And these are pretty sophisticated monitors. They're very similar to the noise monitors that are around uh, uh, construction sites and and often around airports or on highways. So so those are just some of the things that that we participate in, um, you know, in, in a testing mode. And our tip table is used uh, also for you know for tipping uh, uh, rolling motorcycles off their kickstand when with uh, luggage and stuff. So it's not a bunch of exciting testing. It's basically a measurement by a recognized test procedure. Slide, please. So when we come to, to sound, um, sound has been one of our, our, our primary challenges over the years um, when it comes to motorcycles and hot rods. And um, sound measuring utilizes a sound meter, which is a precision instrument which basically looks at minor pressure pulses of the sound from the vehicle. And there are a lot of different test methods, and I'll talk about those in a moment, uh, that, that we use to, to quantify what the sound level is. So, you know, a couple of the, the, the photos here, I, you know, I like the classic photo of the, the motor officer with his, with his old, old school sound meter. Um, where he's taking a, a, a measurement of exceptionally loud or unusually loud vehicles. So that's a very, that's a good screening mechanism to, to, to figure out, you know, how loud is it really in the real world? And that type of 
measuring methodology is is used today. Um, you know, the photo on the bottom right shows a, a motorcycle, you know, on a racetrack, and we're taking some some measurements on that. And very often, with knowing the the sound level at a given distance, we can extrapolate the data out and know about where it uh, acoustically vanishes into the environment. Um, so, so that's you know, you know, that's a field screening mechanism um, that that provides some some environmental information to us. And I'm going to present um, at a later date uh, an in-depth sound study where we've done work. To, to quantify uh, OHV sound in in a variety of uh, environments, you know, um, sand dunes as well as as racing venues. But that's that's another topic. It's a little bit more involved than I than I want to get involved in right now. So when we take these measurements, very often our our um, data is compiled into a uh, a scientific report that is usually peer reviewed. And it serves as a foundational document that that industry um, and regulatory agencies um, can utilize for planning purposes. You know the sound challenge that we've had. Um, you know, it goes way back, uh, and so the motorcycle industry and the motorcycle industry council and the uh, American Motorcyclists Association and and uh, many other um, sanctioning bodies have, have, have struggled with how do we control the sound and some of it is outreach and some of it is testing and some of it is enforcement and some of it is is voluntary compliance from the from the manufacturers and i have to say that the manufacturers the vehicle manufacturers and the and the aftermarket component manufacturers we're all working kind of in the same same direction to, to minimize the sound. Slide, please. So, you know, uh, we have a lot of new technology vehicles coming forward, and, and I uh, wanted to uh, participate in, in Novak's um, uh, educational uh, curriculum to, to, to help, um, help us all get a kind of a handle on, on some of what's coming. So, you know, we've we've all seen sand over sand vehicles and over snow vehicles, and of course the the you know the conventional dirt vehicles and, and street and track and trail. And a lot of these vehicles are actually starting to to overlap. We have very you know for the off road side, we have uh, motorcycles you know that are on highway uh, legal vehicles that are very capable off highway you know the dual sport mark is is really growing um it's you know experiencing you know substantial growth um the vehicles are you know a, a variety of, of sizes from the very small entry level 200 cc or slightly above 200 cc's on up to you know 13 or 1400 cc so you have a lot of selection there and the same goes to uh you know, to the the youth vehicles and and side by side. So so we have a, a lot of, of recreational platforms that are are available and 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 it's good recreation and and with that you know sometimes we um sometimes we have some challenges and and um, you know sound continues to be one of the the challenges that we um, uh, struggle with and sometimes it's it's you know, the, the vehicles are, are are too loud um you know for the for the communities where they recreate and and now we're even starting to see vehicles that are not loud enough you know and i'm talking about the the electrics and and so we're going to see we're going to see more uh more electric vehicles and and with that comes you know a, a set of of, of challenges that uh, as land managers and enthusiasts we we kind of need to understand. So so when we uh, when we start talking about about sound, um, slide please. We start talking about sound. I'd like to you know, touch just briefly on 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 sound types. 
you know, impulsive sounds um, like a gunshot or a hammer strike or slamming the tailgate of, of, of your truck. You'll have, uh, typically you'll have a, you, uh, a fairly fast rise time in, in the pressure. Uh, sometimes it's fairly loud. Um, and then the decay, and the decay is, is relatively rapid. So it's a, you know, it's a short duration sample. So we'll call those impulsive sounds. Um, and when we look at, at some of the planning documents, once in a while there's confusion there because they'll, uh, a, a planner will put in the, the, the level max, the, the maximum level. And, and that sometimes is very, very misleading as to what they're trying to describe. And, and, and I, I have to deal with that on, on an educational basis, on a, on a regular basis. So, so keep in mind that impulsive sounds uh, and your sound meter, when you put, put the meter to level A max, you know, false positives are, are, are very common and, and they're not overly uh, good uh, descriptors of what, what this, the vehicle sound really is. So, a sh you know, moving down to a short duration sound, like a vehicle passing. Now, that's a pretty decent uh, uh, measurement to take. Um, you know, usually it's a sample of, you know, around a second. You, you typically, you know, a, a, an eighth of a second to a half a second. Um, and with a sample of that length, we can take a pretty good measurement on that. And we will, your sound meter would be set at, at uh, level A fast, which, which allows the, the uh, integration to happen pr pretty rapidly. Um, but for, for most of our uh, field work, we like to use level A slow, which, uh, which you know, has the meter respond to you know, a running half to one second worth of data. And that tends to filter out the anomalies and give, gives us a much more accurate measurement of, of the sound. Um, when we're dealing with community sounds, um, very often there will be a, you know, uh, a, a, an LEQ, an average sound, a level equivalent over a period of time that we need to, to, to be aware of. Um, and the, uh, the noise control, the EPA Noise Control Act of 1972 kind of goes into that. Um, trying to you know, quantify average sounds over, over time. Uh, and also OSHA has a, um, a sound requirement, which helps us minimize um, the, 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 the health damage from, from uh, overexposure. So you know, when we look at, at sound, um, you know, it's, it's fairly complicated. Um, and we're going to just, in this lecture, just use um, level A slow, and, and that's how we're going to take a measurement for most of the vehicles. But, but I really want everybody to kind of understand that um, you know, we're talking about decibels, amplitude, the loudness, and the A-weighted network, which is the frequencies that we can hear. So the bottom graphic, this, uh, this uh, what looks like a, a fuzzy EKG, um, that's actually a stationary sound test being done on, on a motorcycle. You see that, and we're taking that measurement um, at 20 inches from the exhaust. And so we start the motorcycle and sitting there idling. And then the two humps is when we, when I rev the engine up and taken my measurement. And so I've taken you uh, two measurements of about a, you know, uh, you know uh, second to, to second and a half um, uh, on each, and um, I'll report the value. But that's kind of what sound is, and and when we start looking at at sound, uh, the tenth of a decibel, you know, it it can get kind of confusing. So in reality, we really want to just look at the whole numbers. You know, is it a 92? Is it a 94? Is it a 99? We don't really need to go into the 99.8 or you know, the go into the into the decimal points. Slide, please. So when we start talking about transportation sound, we take measurements uh, in, in a variety of, of, of ways. Um, 
and when we're doing research, very often we'll take measurements uh, all the way around the perimeter of the vehicle to see just how the sound is radiating, uh, because you all uh, you know all of the components make a make a bit of a contribution. So so this top left slide is one, is one of my favorite slides. Um, when that's part of when we we're doing the um, the, uh, the California OHV sound study, and we took a lot of measurements, and there's a really cool graphic in that report um, that kind of shows how the energy radiates out from from the sound source. Um, for federalization, you know, very often we'll do a dynamic test. You know, the um, you know, the yellow pickup truck it, um, is one of the vehicles that we tested. You know, and that's an acceleration test. You know, up you know, up the airport runway. Um, it mimics kind of getting on the freeway with enthusiasm. Um, so we can take a total vehicle sound uh, like uh, like the vehicle is when it experiences when you're accelerating hard. And then of course we've got you know, airport sound and when we're trying to quantify you know, how loud specialty aircraft or helicopters are and the flight path, we'll kind of want to know what uh, you know what the what the noise exposure is going to be to the community. So, so with transportation, we, we take a variety of measurements using a variety of test methodologies to help us get a uh, get a get a measurement that that relates to something. Slide, please. So, with each type of measurement of course you're going to get a different result and they are can be somewhat related to each other um but they won't directly correlate and so you know the the the, the two photos we have one photo of an accelerating motorcycle that's going to it's going through the epa drive-by test procedure uh, which is going to quantify the sound of of that vehicle so so we test it one way, and and it's a shorter acceleration um, uh, period, and that motorcycle, you know, is 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 below 80 decibels, and so so by the federal test procedure, it would be compliant. Uh, now, when we start looking at other test procedures uh, where the the drive cycle is significantly different. Or we might be looking at 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 uh, the absolute maximum sound potential, where the speeds would be higher, the RPM would be higher. Um, of course, we're going to get some different uh, uh, some some different results, and that's what the graphic is in the middle. Um, and then, if we were to take a measurement using the the, the stationary close proximity test, um, we would you know, take a look at you know at the, the sound that is related just to the exhaust system. So, you know, each one of these tests are useful, but they'll tell us different things. Slide, please. So today we're going to really talk about uh, about the stationary field sound test methods that we would would use for for screening vehicles. Um, to to make a determination if the exhaust system is compliant. So you know if we're if we're having a discussion about on highway motorcycles, um, there is a test procedure which is uh, uh, published by the Society of Automotive Engineers, and, and all these test procedures are, are published uh, recommended practices. So you know we're we're taking a measurement on you know on on the motorcycles and and the car at 20 inches from the exhaust at a prescribed RPM, which corresponds to a, a, a uh, percentage of the maximum horsepower RPM. Typically, it's about 50%. So SAJ 2825 is, is a good screening tool for, for on-highway uh, vehicles. Our, our old buddy SAJ 1287 is what we what we've Used you know for a long time for the uh, for the off highway vehicles. Um, it pertains also it applies to the the, the, the side by sides. Um, the automotive industry utilizes a, a very very similar uh, test procedure 
SAE uh, 1492 or 1169. These are 20 inch test methods and it, it, it takes a measurement uh, close proximity 20 inches from, from the exhaust. And the whole goal is to, to have you know, an understanding of the sound level of, of the vehicle. For over snow vehicles, you know, snowmobiles, conventional snowmobiles, there is a, a, a test method, you know, 2567, um, and it's a, it, it's, it's a test method that is taken at a slightly uh, further back distance, and that you know, is at a, um, a relatively low engine speed, about 4,000 RPM. That's about where the belt you know, starts engaging, and it's a static test, and that will, will help us quantify uh -huh. the, the sound level of, of an over snow, uh, conventional snowmobile. Um, snowmobiles have a challenge with, you know, with the bodywork shielding. Very often you will have resonance or vibration. And if you're, if you're in the close, in the near field, in the close proximity, very often those, um, you know, those vibrations will give you a false positive. So, so the technical community has, has developed a test that uh, we're a little bit further away uh, from from the vehicle and that helps us eliminate false positives. Slide please. So when we get down to, to motorcycle and off-highway vehicle uh, sound testing, typically uh, typically uh, the, the, the test you know is is done with, with basic handheld field friendly instrumentation. Um, it's fairly robust. Um, it you know can be damaged, of course, but the, the 20 inch you know stationary sound test method has been proven to be uh, pretty repeatable and effective um, in reducing the environmental sound. So we're doing source sound control with with the um, with the SAE J1287 test method. And typically, our control levels are are, are around 96 decibels. Um, that doesn't disqualify any uh, EPA compliant vehicles, and it, it makes sure that uh, an adequate muffler is 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 functioning. And when the vehicles are running, uh, that uh, that test method, you know, lets us have. Uh, a pretty good understanding of the acoustic vanishing distance um, on on the sound. So, you know, 94 to 96 decibels is has been proven to be pretty effective um, with with managing uh, sound levels. And you know, when we say it's a 96 decibel vehicle, that may be a you know a, a, a you know, a 78 decibel vehicle through the federal test procedure, uh, the drive-by test. But we're really in the field, really just concerned about about modified exhaust. We really don't care too much about air intake sound or chain rattle or tire sound or or any of the other sounds. We're really primarily concerned with exhaust sound because that's what the neighbors hear. Slide, please. So we, as we take our as we take our measurements, um, we do need to have a, a pretty good understanding that that the, the the procedures are different from each other, and they will tell us different things, and that helps us make an educated decision on on what we need to do to uh, uh, to control and manage the sound in, in the environment. And the static test method, the stationary sound test method, is is easy to do, and it is effective. And you can do it with a you know, with a pretty basic uh, setup of of instruments, um, a sound meter, tachometer, and a tape measure, and you're pretty much good to go. And when we start talking about the dynamic, the drive-by test, um, it gets very complicated. The 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 surface makes a difference, the tires make a difference, the, the, the driver or the rider makes a difference, and since it's a, a, a measurement that's taken at a, at, a, uh, at, a, at a distance, the instrumentation needs to be significantly more advanced, and that can get rather costly, and some of those overly expensive instruments 
aren't really justifiable for field screening, you know, close proximity uh, measurements. So, so sometimes we don't need to have a, a twenty thousand dollar sound meter. We can, you know, for for evidence gathering, you know, a class one sound meter. You know, is is you know, around three to four thousand dollars, and you can produce extremely reliable improvement data on with a class one and with an ANSI class two. Uh, the precision isn't there, but the cost drops dramatically, and usually that's sufficient for a for, for field screening. You know, a, a technical inspection, um, yeah, trying to to help somebody get in the compliance. But for evidence gathering, that's kind of a different story. Slide, please. So when we start talking about the the, the instruments, um, the the instruments will be um, categorized by accuracy and performance level. Um, they'll have a uh, some identification. Usually, it's on the instrument itself, which will it'll say ANSI class one. And a date, uh, and and some other uh, some other information that's on on that. But a class one is is an evidence and a, and and research level instrument. they um they have a different technology microphone and a processing uh, capability. So so a class one is 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 a research piece of equipment or or an evidence gathering piece of equipment. A class two instrument. Um, are you know I call those awareness level instruments you know from the factory you know their um, their stated accuracy is is you know within a decibel and a half which is pretty close and you can calibrate and tune them to be you know within about a half a decibel but they they do have some some shortcomings when it comes to um, you know uh, to, to accuracy and repeatability so so for for the majority of the uh, applications, we would use a you know a class one if we're going to write a report or issue a citation or disqualify somebody at the pro level, and we would use a, a class two if we're uh, trying to get most everybody into compliance and give them information you know a, a measurement result that's that's you know you know within a half a dB or so that's that's pretty good and. You know, many of the instruments, will, you know, particularly the class ones, will have advanced features. You know, where you can do frequency processing and recording and then take pictures and generate reports straight out of the the handheld analyzer, which is which is really nice. But sometimes that's not sometimes that's not completely justifiable in in the field. And we're seeing a, a new crop of of class ones that like just just uh, just got a couple of them in, um, you know, that are relatively low low cost, you know, for for a class one, you know, you know, three or four thousand dollars, and they have a wireless uh, feature where you can control it from your from your cell phone, uh, so you don't need the expensive and sometimes fragile extension cable, um, and and you can uh, can can view and control the, the sound meter uh, remotely, which is kind of a nice feature. Uh, class twos, you know, they're they're prim primarily a a a, uh, a budget instrument, and so some of those features just just haven't trickled down to them yet. And um, since we're in a high pulse environment, you know, close to a pulsating pressure, you know, near the exhaust, um, the uh, uh, apps for for cell phones. They they're just not suitable for this application. Um, that you can't calibrate them, and that microphone just doesn't like the the pressure pulse. So you you know, we we don't even want to start to go there with them yet. But you know, being in the in the science field, you know, I never say never. Maybe someday, but uh, maybe we'll solve the uh, the noisy muffler challenge before we get there. Okay, slide please. So anytime I talk about about you know, sound and mufflers, I always kind of want to talk about spark arresters and kind of what is a muffler and what is a spark arrestor, kind of what their functions are. And and so for 
you know, for off-highway vehicles, a U.S. Forest Service qualified spark arrester, it does not adversely impact performance, and it does a world of good from, from keeping the, the glowing embers from getting out into the, into the environment. And so very often, we'll see a screen-style spark arrester being used. They're the lowest cost, um, and they're pretty easy to, to, to qualify and manufacturer to qualify and the replacement cost is pretty low and typically they have a 23 to 24 thousandths open mesh so uh that you know so we're able to uh screen the, the glowing embers and contain them before they get out into the environment so we'll see a lot of different designs on on on, on spark arresters um you know in the past we've seen the disc style um, you know, super trap spark arresters or the turbine style, you know, the, the Krinsman style spark arresters or, or, a, uh, or a trap style spark arrestor, which has baffles. But one of the things that's coming forward um, right now, uh, you know, many of the uh, on highway legal emission controlled vehicles that are off road uh, capable have a uh, have a catalytic converter, and and the catalytic converters that are that are coming forward um, are you know a, a a honeycomb style, and they have a you know 23 to 24 thousandths uh, clearance, and so the spark arrester function is being handled uh, by the catalytic converter, and so you'll start seeing catalyst style spark arresters that are fully qualified coming uh it, coming into uh our industry here very very soon and and with the blessings of of the manufacturers and and also the uh, u.s forest service so we'll, we'll we'll see how that comes along but uh right now you know, most of the big adventure bikes have have a catalytic converter and a mechanical style muffler and we're you know, some of the uh what I'll call adventure light or dual sport bikes, like the like the new Honda 450L has a catalyst uh, exhaust. Um, they've also in on the Honda they they've also put a screen style um, spark arrestor in that. Um, and so so we're going to see some some new technology coming forward, and that's you know you know that's going to be a benefit because the catalysts um, are extremely durable and and they're you know, um, regulated their the construction and durability is regulated by the federal government, and they're basically for motorcycles. They're they're a uh, you know a lifetime component with that doesn't require maintenance. So when we talk about maintenance, uh, you know, very often you know we have two styles of mufflers in in our industry. We have a mechanical chambered style muffler uh, that has baffles in it. Um, and then we have an absorption style muffler, which you know, old school we would call them a glass pack. And the glass pack, you know, or absorption style mufflers have a have an absorbing media in in them, in them, and it requires maintenance um, because it's subjected to you know, if it's on a two-stroke, it it gets uh, uh, fouled with with oil, and if it's uh, you know, on some of the four strokes with the, 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 the high temperatures, the heat tends to degrade them. So, so replacing the, the spun roll, the packing material occasionally is, is, is needed. And so, um, you know, when we're working in the field, you know, if you hear an exhaust system that's, that's really loud and it's an absorption style, very often um, it just needs service. Basically it needs to be rebuilt. And so you take the, the can off and you know, get out the take off the the, the the spun wool and clean the the perforated core and you know, put some new packing in it, slide it back together. So so um, when somebody says that they just repack their muffler or they need to repack, um, that's what they're talking about. Slide please. So with any luck, we'll have a video play. Um, Anytime we do a presentation, there's always challenges with videos. So, so if if the video play, that would be nice. And oh, it does. Hi, 
I'm Chris Friel, DPS Technical. Today I'm going to do a little demonstration on taking a stationary sound test on an ROV app. These vehicles are rather large. Sometimes we want to use some additional equipment. Today I'm going to demonstrate doing a sound test using both a handheld instrument, which I've got mounted on a tripod, or an instrument that has a remote microphone capability, which I've also mounted on a tripod. The instrument is set uh, in the proper location as to the test machine 20 inches away at a 45 degree angle. Um, the other instrument that we'll be using today is a vibration style tachometer. This vehicle does not have an onboard tachometer and it also is very difficult to get uh, access to a spark plug to, to get to the high tension lead. So we're going to use a vibration style tachometer um, to hold steady state RPM while we're taking our measurement. We're taking our measurement with an instrument that has a remote microphone. It's easy to take the, the sound meter that has the display up to the, the driver compartment so we can take a take a measurement with just one person. Uh, in the event we don't have that ability, then we need two people um, to, to help us. So we'll you know, have the driver hold steady state RPM while we while we take the measurement. I'm Chris Real, DPS technical. In order to use this instrument, we just need to place the, the instrument on a surface that gets a vibration. So I'm going to demonstrate using the vibration tachometer on the seat, which gets vibration, um, or the steering wheel, or, or any other part of the of the chassis. But uh, the seat and the steering wheel are are, are pretty good um, vibration receivers. So we'll set the vibrating read on this uh, for this demonstration at 3,000 RPM. When we get to the proper RPM. The end of the tachometer will vibrate and indicate when we are to take our sound measurement. If we're below the RPM, the needle is steady. If the right RPM, we get a right oscillation. And if we get above the RPM, the needle settles out again. Okay, so so you know the, the stationary sound test that we just demonstrated that was on an ROV, but it's it's the same method as we would use on the um, on a on a motorcycle, and it's very similar. It's the same method we would use for a, for a car as well. So so you know the, the the stationary sound test is 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 repeatable, and we get good solid data. 
Um, very often, I all you know, I'm available in in person if you've got a question, or I do a lot of outreach. I participate as a technical inspector uh, at some of the some of the events and help out. Um, um, also, pretty active in the uh, you know, in the rules development in the in the motorcycle industry, you know, the technical committees from SAE or Motorcycle Industry Council or or some of the other uh, committees. So so usually I have you know uh, pretty current technical information and the good fortune of being able to test some of the the, the new vehicles. Um, my contact information is there if anybody needs to reach out. Slide please. So for, 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 for next time, um, you know, we're, we'll talk a little bit more about environmental sound control and what, what, the, uh, what the effects of an individual vehicle noise control, uh, how does that translate out to, to our recreation areas and, and our communities? And that's a subject for, for next time. So we've allocated some, some, some time here. This pretty much concludes my portion. And I'd I'd like to uh, you know have Dwayne or or anybody um, you know, uh, you know, ask some questions and 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 hopefully I've been able to cover some of the basics of of field sound uh, sound measurement in 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 this portion of of the lecture. So uh, when I started, I, I said that I was I was just a presenter, but it was your presentation. So 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 how can I uh, Help you. So, <clears throat> thank you. This is Dwayne. Thanks, thanks, Chris. That was really enlightening. Um, and I've been around, like I stated at the beginning, for a long time, and you answered some questions that I've always had. Um, <clears throat> would encourage anybody who has questions to type them in using the chat feature. Uh, we'll get to all of them. Uh, but Chris, I, I have a question for you from the get-go, and you touched on it just a bit. But it's, you know, when you see the sound manual, it tells you which vehicle you need to run at which RPM to get a definitive sound test. You mentioned that that's a percentage of either maximum capability or max speed or whatever it is. Um, but could you describe a little bit how they come up with that figure and why they're different for, for different vehicles? Sure. Um, for, for the stationary sound test, you know, and we'll talk specifically about motorcycles and ATVs, um, the, 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 we, first of all, we want the, the stationary test you know, to, to be non-destructive. And, and so we don't want to over rev the engine. So, so for the SAE J1287 test, uh, we use 50% of max rated RPM. So if you look at a dynograph where the, you know, the horsepower peaks, you know, and most of the vehicles, it peaks somewhere, you know, most of the trail vehicles, it peaks somewhere around 7,000 RPM on a motorcycle and somewhere around 6,500 RPM or so on a, uh, on a, uh, you know, on a, a lower speed vehicle. So we'll take 50% of, of max rated and use that as our, as our um, sound test RPM. And, and that gives us a very good um, uh, measurement point because the, the vehicle's starting to be in, in its power power band and we're able to take a measurement at, at that point. And really at about 50% of max rated, um, you know, um, that's typically where a lot of the vehicles spend a, a good amount of their operational time. Um, so, so we, you know, so we've chosen that RPM 50% uh, of max rated to be you know, uh, non-destructive and, and it gives us a, a, a good measurement point um, that we can do in the field without, without damaging the vehicle. We don't want to over rev them because they're, they're stationary. Also, we don't want to uh, overheat them. And in the event the vehicle were to drop into gear, um, you know, it, if we're at, at you know, uh, you know at, at about 4,000 RPM, 3,000 RPM, the vehicle's going to move, but it's not going to take off like a racehorse. So that's that's where we come up with that that uh, you know that percentage. And of course, the vehicles are are do change. You know, uh, you know the you know the ATVs. And most of the side by sides, as an example, we're we're sound testing them around 3,000, 3,500 RPM, 
and and that's uh, you know you know it's non-destructive and and it it's pretty representative of of how they're they're operated. You know the racing motorcycles, you know the uh, the motocross bikes in particular. You know very often those are you know 10,000 10,500 RPM uh, capable engines, and so uh, we'll sound test them down around 5,000 4,500 to 5,000. 500 rpm so so basically it's a percentage of max rated which is non-destructive and representative of 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 engine speed and and non-destructive awesome thank you for clearing that up that's something i've wondered for a long time so i appreciate your expertise there um we do have a couple questions um on the chat feature um first is when amending a bylaw what would you recommend to have as a SAE J1287 set level of sound for OHVs in an urban area? 96 decibels works. And, and there's scientific peer reviewed technical papers that support that. And, and so 96 decibels at, at a, as an absolute maximum works and it, resolves most of the problems um, and you know the good side is the, the the good folks of the state of California spent you know almost a million dollars to to screen and prove you know what test method and um, uh, control level is effective and you can download all of that research and the report to the legislature and all of the Office of Legal Review uh, wording straight from the California OHV website. So you, it works and they've done all the work for you and, and, and you can take that and, and uh, not have to try to reinvent the wheel. Um, but if you went to if a state or a municipality said, well, you know, California says 96, we're going to leave the pack and say it's going to be 92 as an example, then what would happen is you stand the chance of having an EPA compliant vehicle, not a stock vehicle, not be compliant with a regional regulation. And when you have a conflict like that, very often you wind up with um, you know, non-compliance, and it becomes very difficult for the municipality to defend themselves um, because their, you know, their their bylaw may not be based on scientific fact, and that gets challenging if it goes to court. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next question is: Could you expand on your information regarding sound level versus distance from measurement recorded? Okay, um, that you know uh, the inverse square mechanism is is uh, it, it's widely utilized. So every time we double the distance, best case scenario, we lose about six decibels, and that works. Um, you know, um, you know when you're when you're dealing with um, you know pretty predictable environments, um, and so if we you know if we have a you know a, let's say we have a, a you know, a vehicle that's an 80 decibel vehicle at 50 feet. And if we went to 100 feet, we would take six off that. So that's a, you know, uh, that's a 74 decibel predicted measurement. And that works reasonably well. However, when we start getting in, into the real world, uh, where there's wind and temperature inversions and and different ground covers and reflective sources, then it it becomes very problematic to run a uh, you know a projection, yeah, you know, just a mathematical projection. Then you have to take a measurement. But every time you double the distance, six dB is your reduction factor, but, but that only really works when you start getting um, into you know, out of the near field. So it starts working at about 50 feet and 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 it's pretty accurate on out you know, uh to somewhere around you know 500 to a thousand feet uh, for for motorcycles but but you know there's a lot of, of of other considerations that will 
will change the sound because not all of the frequencies attenuate at the same at the same rate. They don't decay at the same rate. So, you know, so I I say six decibels with a great big, you know, uh, apostrophe, you know, and and uh, and and parentheses saying well most of the time, and I hope so. Does that awesome. help? Thank you. Yes, perfect. Um, next question is, often we see claims about decibel levels of generators used in recreational use. At what distance are they typically tested? Well, typically we'll, on, on generators, we'll, we'll take a near field, you know, uh, uh, you know, three feet, you know, you know, 20 inches, three feet. Very often we'll take a, we'll take a measurement at 10 feet. Um, that you know, uh, when you start getting a couple meters out from the from the from the sound source, it becomes not so uh, directionally sensitive. Um, and so, so typically, you know, typically when we'll, we'll take a measurement out at at uh, you know, at least two meters, you know, around ten feet is is um, is is a pretty good way of taking a measurement on on a on a generator. And generators are kind of nice because of the, uh, you know, their, their, their steady state RPM. And so you can take a, you, you can take a measurement pretty easily and they have static loads. So, you know, most of the, uh, most of the, you know, smaller transportable generators, they run it, you know, you know, you know, you know, 2,500 to 3,000 RPM, you know, constant uh, when they're under load and you can, you can take a measurement around the perimeter and it won't change too much. So, so hopefully they, I answered the question somewhere around 10 feet. Awesome. Thank you. I, I think you did. Um, that seems like the last question. Um, I'm going to be talking here for another minute or two. So if somebody has a last second one and wants to enter it in, please do. Um, but I just personally want, want to thank you, Chris. Um, I think it, everybody listening probably got a sense of, of your extensive expertise and knowledge in this area. And we're thrilled you're working with us because um, it's nice to have this voice um, and this, this expertise just so readily available to all of us. And you so freely offer your uh, phone number and email and, and assistance. And I know personally that, uh, that you help just about anybody who calls. So it's really, really beneficial what you do for the OHV community. Um, I think, you know, that the sort of the sound slash noise issue is trending in a positive direction. Um, and I'm excited for that because uh, maybe the next generation won't think that fast equals wow, and instead we'll we'll have uh, ability to recreate and not disturb too many people. Um, I also want to make sure we mention, as you did just a bit earlier, that this is the first in a series, and we're going to have Chris a few more times at least, as many times as he'll put up with us, because uh, I think this is really really good information. I think it's necessary information. Um, I think it's great for OHV enthusiasts to hear. And I think it's really good knowledge base for land managers who, who are trying to understand how to uh, manage this use that we all love so much. So I just want to once again just say thank you. Really appreciate you doing this. Um, there is a bit of breaking news such that it is. Uh, Novak is going to post all of the recorded webinars that we've done in the series to our website. You will have to register for the website to be able to, to view the recorded versions. But uh, there should be an announcement coming out. Uh, probably this week about how to do that. It may take a few extra days to get Chris's presentation up, but it will be available uh, for anybody who wants to watch it and share it. And this great information is going to be um, available uh, to anybody who wants to avail themselves of it. So finally, thanks again, Chris. Other breaking news perhaps is we, we think we're going to have Chris um, at our conference in Reno this year um, to talk about this issue. Uh, and to just be there and be a resource. And I, I recommend anybody who has the opportunity to come, uh, come out to Reno to do so, uh, because we'll have Chris and other um, really, really cool and, and exciting presentations, um, and hope everybody has a chance to come. With that, Chris, I'll give you the final word if you have anything you want to, to close with. Well, you know, our challenge, uh, our, our challenge as, as you uh uh, enthusiasts, you know, motorized recreation enthusiasts. I mean, we, you know, we look at, at the the impact that that um, that the you know, that recreation has. You know, it's it's 
It's a social impact. It's an economic impact. It's a cultural impact. Um, all of us working together, we do make a difference, and and we can um, you know we can control our sound and and not be you know problematic to the communities and 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 good stewards. So so you know in closing, you know I've you know, uh, I, I've been very blessed to be uh, part of the industry you know a, as a motorcycle rider um, and and. Uh, I'm, you know, fortunate to be able to 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 ride, um, you know, some of the latest motorcycles and scooters uh, out there, and we are truly in for an amazing future. Um, and if we can be good stewards and good custodians, uh, the generations that come behind us will uh, will benefit. And so I I hope to. I hope to see you know, a lot of my friends at the at the at the conference in Reno. Um, I've you know I've allocated some time to come, and uh, you know I, I'm going to try to ride my dual sport bike at a at a dual sport ride up by Bishop on the way up, and then uh, on, the, on our free ride day I might even bring out my old trials bike, and then uh, uh, then I'll be softened up for everybody's questions at the at the uh, at the seminar or at the at the conference but i want to thank everybody for for their attention to detail and participating in responsible motorized recreation call me if you need me awesome awesome thank you thank you so much um and with that we'll um conclude this webinar and we'll have an announcement out in the next couple weeks about what's going to be coming up in july um so i'd appreciate it if you guys just all watch your emails and uh, and log in if it's of interest to you. Thank you, everyone.